All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week so far. We are live on AMP, so if you're watching on YouTube or listening on our podcast feeds, don't forget that AMP is the very first place that you guys can get these shows. We are covering the Los Angeles Clippers today with a full season preview. They come in at number nine in our power rankings. I also have three mailbag questions for the end of the show as well. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT. Don't forget about our podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops tonight. And I need mail bad questions. Remember to drop those in the YouTube comments and we'll continue to hit those at the end of these shows. Last but not least, before we get started, the start of pro basketball is still a few weeks away, but there's no shortage of events to attend in the meantime. Obviously, baseball is in the home stretch of their season. There are still uh, concerts and comedy shows touring around the country. And now we have the return of pro in college football. And the best way to get tickets to any of these events is on Game Time, the fastest growing ticketing app in the United States. So for amazing last minute deals on uh, on tickets to see your favorite baseball team or football team, download Game Time. And again, it's not just sports. All of these concerts and comedians touring around the country, you can also find tickets to those on Game Time. Download the Game Time app and redeem code HOOPS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, download the Game Time app and enter code HOOPS, that's H O O P S, for $20 off. No matter where you live, get out and have some fun this week. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price. Guaranteed. All right, let's talk some basketball. So, quick little offseason recap for the Clippers. They lost Eric Gordon. They added uh, Kenyon Martin Jr. in a trade from the Rockets, a super athletic forward. He averaged 13 points and six rebounds per game last year. He was an okay shooter when he was wide open, 52.4% effective field goal percentage on unguarded catch and shoots. Not great in other situations. He was 43% in effective field goal percentage on guarded catch and shoots, and he was 0 for 5 on off the dribble jump shots. But he was one of the best rim finishers in the league last year. He shot 70% at the rim. He made 327 shots at the rim last year. That was the 15th most in the entire NBA. As a matter of fact, there were only nine players in the NBA last year who made at least 250 shots in the restricted area on at least 75% shooting. And it was eight centers, all dudes who are 6'11 and taller, and Kenya Martin Jr. at 6'7". So, uh, especially on this particular team that struggles with getting to the rim consistently and finishing there consistently, I think Kenyon Martin can help there a lot, especially as a cutter working off the ball with all of the ball handling and shooting that the Clippers have. They also drafted Kobe Brown. He's a big rim pressuring forward. He's a little on the short side. He's only six six and a half without shoes, so he's about you call that six seven and a half, six eight ish with shoes. But he's got super long arms. He's got a seven foot one wingspan, and he weighs two hundred and fifty two pounds. He's a big dude, and he was one of the most efficient post players in the country last year at Missouri. As a matter of fact, only two hundred and forty eight players in the entire country in all of Division one basketball ran at least a hundred post ups, and Kobe Brown ranked third on that list out of 248 players scoring 1.2 points per possession. He's got this really quick baseline spin where he'll kind of catch and look towards the middle, spin back towards the baseline, hit you with that baseline elbow, kind of gets away with a little bit of a chicken wing, which he'll continue to get away with at the next level. And then basically if you cut him off, he'll spin back middle, but he's not looking to take tough, uh, tough shots. He's not taking a ton of hooks. He's not taking a ton of fadeaways. It is a power post game. It's all about positioning and sealing himself inside of uh, an area where he can rise up and quickly finish. Um, I think it'll serve him well attacking switches at the NBA level. I don't think he'll have the same strength advantage, obviously, when he gets to the NBA level going against grown men. But in switching situations or when he does have a mismatch, maybe a cross, a cross match in transition, he's going to have opportunities to beat players in the post. And those quick duck-ins and, and passes over the top, he's going to be able to quickly finish. And he actually shot the ball really well last year as well. Not so much early in his college career, but... Really well last year. 66% in effective field goal percentage on catch-and-shoot jump shots. 79% when he was unguarded. And even 50% in effective field goal percentage on pull-up jump shots. He had lots of rescue possessions last year where he'd end up with the ball with four or five seconds left on the shot clock and he would just go to a quick one dribble pull-up. And because he's got good long arms and he gets good lift on his jump shot, he could just rise over the top of guys and fire. And and that was kind of like a nice little um, release valve last year for Missouri. 
And then obviously with his physical tools, with his super long arms and his athleticism and strength, he's capable of being an impact defender, especially with the Clippers who do a lot of switching one through four. So I think, uh, I think Kobe Brown's going to be an interesting player for the Clippers in the long run. The interesting thing there is going to be they're just super deep at forward and whether or not he's going to be able to get minutes. So let's take a look at the depth chart really quick. So at guard, Russell Westbrook, Norman Powell, Terrence Mann, Bones Highland, and Jason Preston. And at the forward position, again, this is probably the deepest core of forwards in the league. Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Marcus Morris, Nicholas Batum, Robert Covington, Amir Coffey, Kobe Brown, Kenyon Martin Jr., and Brandon Boston. And then their bigs right now, Avika Zubak, uh, Mason Plumley, and Musa Diabate. So I'm relatively certain their starting lineup will look like what it did in Game 1 versus the uh, Suns last year. So it's probably going to be Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Nick Batum, Russell Westbrook, and Avika Zubak. Now, what I would like to see them do in the long run is especially since Batum kind of started to show some uh, signs of decline in that series, didn't uh, attack closeouts very well. He was like just barely over a half of a point spot-up situations, not the same defender that he used to be as he's starting to get older. I'd actually like to see them go with Terrence Mann in the starting lineup. I think there's this thing with Ty Lue in general where he seems to think of those two as kind of like uh, one or the other. Like if he's feeling Russ, he'll stay with Russ. Mann will come off the bench for him, and then he might close with Mann over Russ if it – gets to that point at the end of the game and Russ isn't really all that engaged. That seems to be kind of the way Ty Lue sees it. I actually think I'd go with both of them. I think, first of all, that's your five best players. If you're ranking the players on this team, Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook are 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 in that list, right? Like it's Terrence Mann, Russell Westbrook, and Ivica Zubak are your third, fourth, and fifth best players probably, right? Uh, Norman Powell could be in that discussion, but I'd say Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook, right? So if that's the case... You're allowing yourself to play your best five guys. You're adding two rim pressure guys in Russell Westbrook and Terrence Mann to kind of complement uh, uh, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George as you know guys who are more driving to look for pull-up jump shots, right? They're driving to get position for pull-up jump shots. And so getting a couple of guys who pressure the rim well. Also, they both... Both of those guys can switch onto forwards defensively, and Kawhi and Paul George can switch onto guards defensively. I also like the idea of being more aggressive. This is a defense that did not force as many turnovers as they probably could last year and didn't get out in transition as much as they probably could last year. And so I would, in the long run, if I was running this team, I would start Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook together with Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, and Evika Zubak. So uh, just so you know, that lineup played zero minutes last year. So it'll be interesting to see if we get a chance to see it this year. Um, before we go into the offensive end of the floor, I wanted to talk really quickly about load management. So uh, uh, Ty Lue referenced this in, I believe, in the postseason presser, if I remember correctly. But basically, he wants them to take the regular season more seriously this year. And I think that's a good idea on a bunch of different levels. I think I think, uh, especially when you're integrating a newer piece like Russell Westbrook, continuity is going to be an important advantage. Most importantly, like the the load management thing, you got to look at it in the bigger picture. The there is no evidence that load management actually prevents injuries from taking place, right? And I mean, one of the best case studies of that is the Clippers. They're incredibly careful about making sure that their stars don't play too much. And those two guys missed a third of the season, basically. They combined to miss 56 games last year. And as we look back at the last three playoff runs that they've been in, actually four playoff runs, so we have this year, neither Kawhi Leonard or Paul George were able to finish a playoff run, right? Last year, Paul George is healthy, but then there's a late COVID scratch, but I won't blame him for that. But only one of them is healthy for a potential playoff run, right? 2021, only one of them is healthy, right? Because Kawhi Leonard gets hurt in the uh, towards the end of the Jazz series, right? So Paul George ends up finishing that playoff run by himself. And in 2020, both Paul George and Kawhi Leonard were available. They just didn't play well, right? So I've got one time in four postseasons that both of them were actually able to finish the playoff run. So load management's not working for them. And, you know, I can't say for certain if – you know, playing more frequently in the regular season and conditioning yourself for the playoff run is actually a good thing or whether it would work. But it's worth a try at this point because the status quo is not working. And so I would like to see the Clippers attack the season with more urgency throughout, hunt for a higher seed. Then you might be able to limit minutes in the first round and not have to push your guys 
to a crazy intense level in the first round series against Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, right? Like there's advantages to taking the regular season more seriously, not to mention continuity, helping Russ learn to fit in with this group. I, I, that's, that's the way that I would approach the season. I believe that's the approach that Ty Lue is going for. And if so, it could be potentially a sign of things changing with the Clippers. For a limited time, you can save up to 40% off on an NFL Plus Premium annual subscription when you sign up through Plus Play from Verizon. Plus Play. It is a platform where you can shop, manage, and save on the subscriptions you already love, like NFL Plus. With NFL Plus Premium, you get access to live games on mobile, NFL Red Zone, NFL Network, and more. So you can watch multiple games all at once on any screen around you for updates. Never miss a touchdown. That's simple. And for fantasy players, NFL Plus Premium makes all the difference. Access to programming like Fantasy Live through the NFL Network. Red Zone for tracking player performances on a Sunday. Access to live local and primetime games. Access to Fantasy Plus. Just go to verizon.com slash NFL to get NFL Plus Premium today. 40% off, that's 40% off an annual subscription, just $59.99 for the full season. Get it before it's gone. We're back with another week of football, and DraftKings Sportsbook is keeping us in on the NFL action with great offers every single game day. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Throw five down on any of this week's epic matchups and walk away an instant winner. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game day this September. Football's more fun when you're in on the action. So download the app now and sign up with code HOOPS. New customers can bet just $5 to get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on the DraftKings Sportsbook app, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, with code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. The crown is yours. All right, let's talk about the offensive end of the floor for a minute. Now, again, it's hard to read too much into these numbers um, because Kawhi and PG missed 56 games combined, and Russell Westbrook came into the offense at the end of the season. But they were 17th in offensive rating last year, 17th in half-court offense, according to Cleaning the Glass, heavy into matchup attacking. They were top 10 ISO and top 10 post-up team. This is not a team that runs as much pick and roll as the other teams in the league. This is not a team that methodically looks to pick you apart with ball movement and high-level playmaking. This is a team that runs some sort of action, typically a pick and roll or a dribble handoff or an off-screen action off the ball to try to get one of their ball handlers, Kawhi Leonard or Paul George, an advantage situation so they can look for pull-up jump shots. And if there's a switch, then they will go to facing up, uh, isolating, or posting up in those spe specific situations. It's kind of a brute force offense in that sense. And they were good at it. They were the sixth best uh, post-up efficiency team in the league. Both Kawhi and Paul George were incredibly efficient in all play types. All, uh, both of them were well over a point per possession in pick and rolls, post-ups, and isos. But again, that's their bread and butter. This is not a team that moves the ball a lot. They were 24th in assists last year. They do not, you know, like I said, they don't have like a, a, a really high level playmaker that's looking to pick you apart and make super high level reads. It's very heavy, a matchup attacking offense, right? As a result of that, they do suffer a little bit from the uh, the brute force offense issues you expect to see in the regular season, right? Like in the, the dregs of the regular season, they're not going to get as many high quality easy shots as the other teams in the league. So their offensive ratings are going to struggle. But what do I always say about brute force offenses? They typically go up a level when they get to the postseason. And that's what happened. Like you got to remember, no Paul George in the Sun Series and you're still integrating Russ but Kawhi is still just a machine that can get to his spots, right? And in the same way that, like, you know, a set offense and, like, ball player movement offense can get to the postseason and start to struggle a little bit as teams scout and play harder, right? You get the exact opposite effect with brute force. A player that is really good at getting to his spots and taking and making tough shots, his impact stays at the same or improves, when he gets to the postseason. And so, like, that's what you saw. Kawhi is just bigger, stronger, and a better athlete than most of the forwards in the league. So he can get to his spots and take and make the shots that he's accustomed to making. Russell Westbrook, 
you know, game one of that Sun series, grabs five offensive rebounds because he's just bigger and stronger and a better athlete than most of the guards on the floor. He ended up getting a massive offensive rebound that he kicked out to Kawhi on the right wing for basically what was the dagger in game one when the Clippers got that win. And then on the defensive end, they upped their physicality and turned finesse pull-up shooters and KD and Devin Booker into players that weren't as efficient as you're accustomed to seeing them. And they ended up getting a big win. And they were actually up by 13 in game two, but obviously the Suns end up pulling that game out. Kawhi Leonard gets hurt. Russ has to revert back to basically on ball Russ, and then things kind of fall apart from there. But like, again, like that's, Whenever I, I, I gauge offenses that take a more brute force approach to thing things, you got to kind of differentiate between regular season success and postseason success. This is a Clippers team that, when push comes to shove, is really difficult to guard, regardless of what the offensive rating says. And we didn't even get Paul George in that mix. We didn't even get to see as much Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook alongside of those guys. Uh, I, obviously, we got to see zero of that. But like, I think they're capable of being a much better regular season offense as well. But don't be dissuaded by low regular season offensive ratings from into thinking that this team is easy to guard because they definitely are not. Um, the biggest area of opportunity for this offense is rim pressure. They ranked 25th in the NBA in restricted area makes. And that's a big part of what limits their ball movement and efficiency in general on offense, right? Like they don't get the offense, you know, they don't get the defense into rotation as often as they probably should. And they really should. Like this, this Clippers team has a shit ton of shooting, like down the roster. And it's not just the role players, it's the stars too, like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are both deadly spot-up guys. And so when you have Russell Westbrook running pick and roll or trying to post up or, or beat someone off the dribble, you've got a lot more space to operate than you see elsewhere in the league. They were the second best spot-up team in the entire NBA, second only to the Philadelphia 76ers. And so that's where I think playing more Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook with the Stars could help a lot because this is a team that doesn't generate a lot of rim pressure and doesn't get the defense into rotation and play drive and kick as much as they should given the amount of shooting they have. So how about you get Terrence Mann and, and Russell Westbrook with room to operate, beating guys off the dribble, get more catch-and-shoot opportunities for Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. Paul George in particular can struggle with efficiency because he almost solely takes extremely difficult shots, so getting him more off-ball opportunities could be really good. Playing more drive-and-kick basketball. Um, I think I think that that is when the Clippers are at their best. And so when they use the tougher shot-making as a counter – and as like a late clock rescue situation type of thing and rely more on their aggregate ball handling and shooting to carry them in the uh, in the rest of these possessions, I think that's a better way for them to play offensively, and that's another reason why I'd like to see them start Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook together. Um, on the defensive end of the floor, and again, these are you know these numbers are a little bit limited because we had Kawhi and Paul George miss so many games and Russell Westbrook came in late. But they were 17th in defensive rating last year, 14th in half-court defense according to Cleaning the Glass, 18th in protecting the paint, opponents' points in the paint per 100 possessions. 17th in protecting the three-point line, three-pointers made, uh, opponent three-pointers made per 100 possessions. 24th in first, uh, forcing turnovers, and they were 16th in keeping teams from scoring in transition. So they were basically below average in every major defensive category except for two. They were really good at uh, rebounding. They were 7th in defensive rebounding, and again, a lot of that is wing athleticism and being able to get – contested rebounds that come long out to the perimeter, right? And then they didn't foul. They committed the seventh fewest, uh, excuse me, they put opponents on the free throw line the seventh fewest times per 100 possessions in the NBA. Uh, but this is another reason why I like the idea of Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook playing together. We mentioned this earlier, but improving your point of attack aggressiveness. You know, Zubak's actually a pretty decent rim protector, uh, he's not great. Like, I don't think you're ever going to be a dominant rim defense, but he's actually a pretty solid rim protector. And I love the idea of switching one through four with man, Russ, you know, uh, um, Kawhi and PG, even with some of the other guys coming in, guys like uh, uh, Norman Powell, right? He's a guy that can switch on to bigger players. We talked a little bit about KJ Martin earlier as a guy who's got a lot of athleticism at the forward position. This is a team that can do a lot of switching, be very aggressive at the point of attack with their strength and athleticism, be very physical at the point of attack knowing that you've got Zubak on the back line. And I think they can force a lot more turnovers and get out and transition more. This is a team that only uh, – they were 18th in transition points scored offensively last year. So they did not get out and transition a lot last year. With guys like Russell Westbrook and Terrence Mann on the roster and K.J. Martin, they should be looking to get out and transition more. And so I'd like for them to be more more physically aggressive – 
uh, you know, a point of attack defense that's trying to force turnovers and get out in transition to supplement their half court offense. So the big silver lining for Clippers fans, uh, when Paul George and Kawhi Leonard shared the floor last year, the Clippers outscored opponents by 8.3 points per 100 possessions, and they were elite offensively. They had an offensive rating of 120.3 when the two of those guys were together. So this team is still super dangerous when they're healthy. It's just, you know, we shouldn't bet on them being healthy. Like, uh, like we said, there's been one time in the last four seasons that the two of them have been healthy for a playoff run, right, and, and throughout the playoff run. So it's not something we should bet on. But we have to be prepared for that as a possibility because if we get to a second round series and Kawhi and Paul George are healthy and they're going against anybody in the league, they are capable of winning. Now, if I had to uh, like make a prediction, obviously I think it's more likely that they end up having injury issues. They, like Chances are they'll probably end up as a bottom half seed like in the 5-8 to eight range and they'll probably end up losing in the first round with one of their stars hurt. That's what's probably going to happen. But we always have to be prepared for the reality of what can happen when Kawhi Le- uh, Leonard and Paul George are healthy. One last note on Russell Westbrook, because obviously I talked a lot of positive with Russell Westbrook today, and he deserves it. He played really good basketball with the Clippers, and I, I want to make sure that I emphasize that up front, but I want to push back on one specific idea, and it was kind of a narrative that came out of the whole Russell Westbrook uh, uh, trade, and uh, most of it was coming from, you know, you know uh, like, Obviously, the Lakers have a very loud and obnoxious fan base, and a lot of like Laker, uh, non Laker fans like to have fun at their expense. So that's part of this, right? But um, there was this narrative that like Russell Westbrook succeeded with the Clippers because they let Russ be Russ and they didn't downtrod him with external pressure. And like it was all the Lakers' fault that Russ struggled. And as someone who literally covered every single game during the Russell Westbrook era in a Lakers jersey, I want to emphasize that that's very much not what happened, okay? Yes, it was a it was an awful basketball fit. There's no doubt that Russ on the Lakers was a bad fit, right? Like, him and LeBron were re- kind of redundant, right, as like big rim-pressuring playmakers, right? The Lakers, uh, before the trade deadline, had no shooting, so Russ didn't have much space to operate. Like playing Russell Westbrook in lineups with LeBron James and Anthony Davis, uh, you know, especially as declined jump shooters, not a great idea. That first year, there's a lot of AD at the four with like DeAndre Jordan on the floor with Russell Westbrook. So, like, don't get me wrong, there were a lot of like fit things that were not great. And then you go to the Clippers, and it was an obvious fit, right? Like. They needed a rim-pressuring playmaker because they didn't have one. They're the second-best spot-up team in the league, right? So they've got a lot more space for Russ to operate, right? Like, they obviously were a much better fit. And then just in general, in terms of, call it, you know, societal pressure, pressure from the fan base, the Clippers were a lower-pressure situation. So there's no doubt that it was a better fit with the Clippers. But, the, but like, to be clear, Russ also started doing things with the Clippers that he didn't do with the Lakers, like, Russ was awesome defensively, especially in the first half of that Sun series before he had to start doing everything on the offensive end. Like, he was incredible. You, you didn't get that with the Lakers, I promise you. He had 13 steals and blocks in the five-game series against the Phoenix Suns. Phoenix ball handlers attempted 13 shots in pick and roll with Russ as the primary defender, and they went just three for 13. On those shots. His back pressure was insane. He would basically get in a trailing position behind the screen and explode, jump off of his left leg and just swat or contest everything from behind. He like legit got in Devin Booker's head in the early part of that series, forcing him into misses inside the three point line. Like Russ was downright disruptive on the defensive end in a Clippers jersey in a way that he was not with the Lakers. Okay. Like, he crashed the offensive glass much more with the Clippers. He had 11 offensive rebound putbacks in 26 games in a Clippers jersey. He had 13 in 52 games in a Lakers jersey. So, like, he was roughly twice as active on the offensive glass when he went to the Clippers than he was with the Lakers. He logged eight Roman possessions in 20, uh, 26 games in a Clippers jersey. He logged just four in 52 games in a Lakers jersey. So, like... He even shot way better. He shot 49% in effective field goal percentage in a Clippers jersey, 42% in a Lakers jersey. So, like, again, I'm a big fan of Russell Westbrook. 
when he's playing winning basketball. Obviously, it was a frustrating experience with him in a Lakers jersey, but like I've always been a fan of Russell Westbrook coming up in the league. It just was frustrating watching him in this transition, especially for a team that I was specifically rooting for. But when Russ is playing winning basketball, he's actually a ton of fun to watch and someone that I'm rooting for. But let's get one thing clear. Yes, the Lakers and Russell Westbrook were not a great basketball fit. But Russ also shares a lot of the blame for not being willing to do the things that the Lakers needed him to do. And then he suddenly ended up doing those things with the Clippers. And so, again, I'm happy for Russ. I'm happy that he's happier with the Clippers. I think it's a much better basketball fit, and I think he can help them as a basketball team and potentially potentially help them win a championship. But let's be clear, he wasn't doing that stuff for the Lakers. Okay, so let's not rewrite history and act like it was the Lakers' fault that Russell Westbrook wasn't playing as good, a high, as high a level of basketball as he did with the Clippers. And honestly, like it's very possible that the embarrassment from that situation for things going the way they did with the Lakers, that might very well have been the reason why he finally accepted that he needed to embrace those things to a greater extent. All right, let's uh, move on to the mailbag questions. First one from Logan. What are your thoughts on Shaden Sharp? Do you think he could be a future first option for the Blazers with Scoot as the Westbrook type of guy? So I am not as high on Shaden Sharp as everyone else. Um, I watched him in Summer League Live again this year, and I watched him last year as well. But this year, I like there was a little bit of a moment in that first Rockets game, the game where Jabari Smith Jr., where he hit the game winner. Um, there was a little bit of a moment at the end of that game where Shaden Sharp started to kind of like he hit a really nice turnaround fadeaway. He started like beating people off the dribble. Uh, he he got ignited by a transition dunk. He dunked on, uh, I think it was the um, um, that big dude who was playing for the Lakers uh, G League team last year, if I remember correctly. I can't remember his name. But he dunked on somebody and got super invigorated and, and like suddenly it like unlocked his downhill aggressiveness and he started beating people off the dribble and getting to the rim and he made like a nice little turnaround fadeaway. He's got that potential. And obviously, like when you combine his athleticism with his touch and, and some of the ability that he has, there's there's going to be games where you watch Shaden Sharp and he looks like, you know, Vince Carter in his prime, right? But the reality is, is like I don't see enough of that like overwhelming confidence and audacity and competitiveness to be like a future first option, personally. That's not to say it can't happen, but like like I said, we had a mailbag question a few weeks back. It might have been last week, talking about like what it takes for a player to become a star, right? And in that, I remember I talked about like like loving basketball, hating losing, overwhelming competitiveness, and audacity, meaning like just like an overwhelming sense of self confidence, right? And like that's the thing is like I think Shaden can be lacking in some of those specific areas, and maybe that's just young kid, and maybe that blossoms later on, and we'll see that from him. But like if I had to guess between Shaden Sharp being like a a really good number three or four in the long run or being like a number one for a team that's com- contending for championships, I lean more towards the former. I think I think he's a guy that's going to be a role player in the big picture. And for the record, I think there's almost a 0% chance that he'll, that he'll be better than Scoot Henderson in the long run. Um, next mailback question. Do you think the Pistons have a chance of making the play-in or even the playoffs with Cade Cunningham coming back? So I picked this question for a very specific reason. Um, those of you guys who have been following the show for a while know this, but like typically speaking, uh, it's difficult to cover the entire NBA. And the way that I choose to cover it is to primarily focus on the relevant teams, the playoff teams. So kind of like this list, like we're doing season previews for the top 20 teams, right? Like I'm not, I don't have the time with having to cover everything else to devote, you know, eight hours in a day to studying film and, and getting ready to cover the Detroit Pistons this year. And like, if you are a Pistons fan and you're looking for coverage, like you're going to get occasional coverage here. Like I'm uh, obviously if they turn out to be relevant, I'll be covering them closely, but like I'm going to watch them and I'm going to, uh, you know, I'll probably watch like 10, 15 Pistons games this year. And I'm going to dive into Cade Cunningham pick and roll numbers and, and, and watch his shot creation development. And we're going to talk about Cade and his development, but like, we're just not going to cover them particularly closely because they're in the lower tier of, you know, teams in terms of overall interest, right? And it's just 
bad business for lack of a better term for us to do that. But like, we are going to cover him to a certain extent, just like we will with any of the other young players in the league. Right. Like we've done a lot of talking about Jabari Smith jr. Lately as a young player that I really like, I really like Cade Cunningham as the big playmaking guard. Right. Um, but the truth is, is I didn't watch the Pistons enough last year to have a really strong opinion about them. And so I can't tell you how I feel about their chances to make the play. And I mean, obviously I think they're probably not going to because of the 20 teams that are in front of them. Um, but like, obviously it's on the table. It's a possibility. And with Kate, uh, it's not just Kate Cunningham. Like I'm also, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name now, but the, the guard they drafted last year, um, the, the one that I talk about all the time, that's my favorite. Um, but I, I, I really like, um, <laughs> it's killing me that I, I have, I have the weirdest memory with this kind of stuff. Like sometimes I'm like laser focused and can remember everything, but like occasional player name, Jaden Ivey. Thank you. Occasional player, player names. I just completely blank on. Uh, but Jaden Ivey is uh, another super, super exciting young player on that, uh, on that roster. So I'll watch him a few times. We are going to cover him, but don't expect too much Pistons coverage this year, to be honest, unless they start, you know, being a 500 team. Last mailbag question, rank Shea Gilgis, Alexander, Alexander, Devin Booker, and Jason Tatum purely as play, uh, purely as players right now, not counting their previous team and playoff success. So in my player rankings, which were obviously factoring in previous team and playoff success, I had Tatum above Booker and Booker above Shea, right? So uh, I'm going to keep Tatum at the top. I just think he's so much more impactful defensively than Devin Booker and Shea Gilgis, Alexander. And he honestly, I think, you know, he gets a lot of criticism as he should because he's made some, uh, uh, spe- especially last year in terms of a little bit of a decline in defensive commitment and a big decline in his overall shot variety, which I think hurt his efficiency in the playoffs a little bit. He deserves some criticism, but I think he gets too much criticism and he still is a guy that's had a lot more big playoff moments than people realize and is still very, 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 very impactful on both ends of the floor. And at the end of the Miami Heat series, like he just was better than Jimmy Butler at the end of the series, right? Until he got hurt. So I'm, I'm pretty high on Jason Tatum. The real question would be, would I be willing to put Shea over Devin Booker? And Shea is a really gifted, um, three level shot creator. Uh, uh, I think he's a higher level, like overall half court surgeon than Devin Booker. That's like what I want to think. Like if I wanted to try to make a case for Shea, that's where it would start. I also think Shea is a better defensive player than Devin Booker, but here's the reality in the first nine playoff games this year. Now, Devin Booker did struggle in the final two games of the Nuggets series, but this is crazy. In the first nine games of the playoff run this year, Devin Booker, 37 points per game, five rebounds, 7.4 assists. 62% from the field, 51% from three and 87% from the line. So like, feels kind of stupid for me to, to, uh, to put Shea over Devin Booker. So I'm going to keep him in the same order that I did in my player rankings. I think Tatum's better than Booker and I think Booker's better than Shea for right now. All right, guys, that's all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you supporting the show. We will be back tomorrow with number eight. Don't forget to drop mailbag questions in the YouTube comments and I'll see you guys tomorrow.